find out in a minute. <laughs> okay, well, there's a, there's a big introduction. I'm sorry the talk will massively disappoint right now, but there you go. Um, right, so this is me. Uh, uh, who am I? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Stu. Uh, I, I do security stuff at a company called Zero Day Lab. Uh, I mainly do social engineering, but also do a little bit of instant response. So the talk earlier on was really, really interesting to me, actually. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, I basically run social engineering campaigns, uh, open source intelligence campaigns, um, banks, uh, Retail companies, software companies. I've broken into all kinds of organisations. I've broken. I was in the US last week. I did my first ever bank job last week in the US. I actually broke into a US branch um, of mo multiple branches, and I was actually behind their cashier desks, logging onto their machines, running code, which was absolutely amazing. Until you realise that you know most people in the US have guns. That's quite scary. Um, <laughs> Luckily, this branch didn't have guns, and I'm here today to do my talk, which is amazing, right? Uh, but yeah, quite scary stuff. And also, I was a British guy in a US-only bank. So how does that work? Uh, I'll tell you about that maybe a bit later on, because it's quite good fun. Um, yes, that's me. I run a community called the Many Hats Club as well. If you haven't seen us, we do stuff on Twitter. We have uh, meetups, and we also um, have a podcast, and we, we talk about security, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, there's my photo and all that kind of jazz. Right, OK, so my journey through I have an unusual journey into InfoSec. Um, so I started out first by uh, being uh, my degrees in ceramics. So that's pottery to the uninitiated. So how do you get into uh, ceramics, uh, to InfoSec? Well, you start off working in InfoSec recruitment. You make lots of phone calls to people, and you learn how to social engineer. That's how I learned. So I actually created fake uh, companies, and I profiled companies. And when I called up the company as a recruiter, I knew so much about their business. It was absolutely amazing. And that's how I kind of got into social engineering when I actually realized that this is actually a bit of a problem, uh, and the trust on the phone. So I actually really started out my social engineering kind of campaigns as being a telephone social engineer, doing phishing, telephone phishing. That's how I kind of started, and then I moved into physical uh, phishing and all that kind of great stuff. And that's what I do now, you know, hacking and all that kind of stuff. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Because it's about developers, right? So how do you social engineer developers? And um, I've spent a little bit of time doing that, so I've, I've, uh, I've got a couple of examples I'll take you through today where uh, uh, attackers have social engineer developers or, or, or earn trust with developers and actually manage to get into environments. Um, I'm going to talk about really how do you actually do that, what's the kind of target selection, because target selection is absolutely key if you want to social engineer someone. The more information you know about somebody, the easier it is to create a good pretext, a good scenario to call somebody. So I'm going to talk about open source intelligence and the power of that. And I'll also talk about you know, how you defend against that. Um, so hopefully this way will keep everyone awake and, and interesting and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, how, how and why? How, how do I do um, social engineering? Why do we do social engineering? So um, there's a little bit about uh, kind of pretext creation and establishing trust. There's like an engagement model for this, right? So you need to kind of look at who your target is. Why, why do you want to target this person? How valuable are they as a target? So they're a developer. They'll probably have access to keys, they'll probably have access to sensitive code, potentially customer data. You know, it's a great way to get in. And of course, um, out of interest, um, who's the developer here? There was a couple. So how much uh, uh, awareness training, security awareness training, secure code have you had in the past like 12 months? Quite a lot, I'd say. Put your hand up if you had training for like social engineer training the last 12 months. So that's not very many, you see, which is, please do not have social engineering training. Don't do it. It's not a good thing. Obviously, it's brilliant. Right? Um, so you do that data, right? So you need to look at what data is on that person, how much data is on them. Then you need to look at, you know, um, what the pretext is going to be and how you engage them and how you kind of exit, how do you get, how quickly can you exit without being detected. It's about not being detected is the absolute key here. And, and there's a kind of something called the trust engagement model, so establishing trust. So you need, you, if you can get like sort of two or three of these kind of the key attributes, then, then you'll actually be very successful at this campaign. So if you can get empathy of your target, if you have authority, if you have likability or credibility, if you can establish trust for whatever reason, okay, then, then you have a high degree of success. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of give you some example of where that works. And this is a phone call I did, not to a developer, um, but to somebody who worked in marketing, um, and, and very, very quickly established trust, and it went terribly wrong for them. So, oh, it didn't, okay. Uh, or not. Let's try again. I love clickers. This is why you don't use clickers in pre presentations. Let's try again. Oh, that's just a bit. It's going to be a keyboard. All right, there we go. Hello, uh, Amy. In what department? Social media. Copy. Sort of, uh, I guess, marketing. Okay, come from you. So the kind of pretext, I had like about four hours to social engineer this company. So I tried this switchboard and just tried to make it good. Hi, Charlotte. 
speaking. Oh, it's after Amy. She's around. Amy. Okay, but um, have I got through to the right department? Oh, no problem. I can pass you over. She's just sitting next to me. Okay, well, maybe you can help. It's, it's absolutely fine. Um, I'm not on the same team, so I'll just transfer you over <laughs> if that's all right. That's absolutely fine. That's <laughs> Great, thanks. No problem. No problem. All of your later. Hello. Hey, is that Amy? Yes, speaking. Amy, it's John from First Choice IT. How are you? Hi, good, thanks. Yeah, good. Um, we're just doing a bit of database work at the moment with you guys, um, just checking Windows accounts and all that kind of stuff. I just want to double check. Have you had any issues logging in today at all? No, no issues. No issues. Okay, fantastic. When, when did you last log in today? Sorry? When did you last log in today? Were you log- logged in this morning? Hello? Are you, were you logged in this morning? Have you logged in? What time did you log in today? Um, twice, I think. It's been fine. Twice. Okay, fantastic. And can I confirm your email address just so I can uh, check the system to check uh, if you've got any issues with the database? Sure, Amy. What do you say? Amy. UK. And what's your Windows username? It's not your email address. Um, it's the. It's different, isn't it? So. It's kind of fantastic. Uh, have you changed your password in the last 30 days at all? This is a uh, first day no. update. Okay, can you confirm the length of your password to me, please, as well, just so I can check? The length of it? Yes, please. Eight. Eight characters? Uh, how many of those are uppercase? None. None. Okay, fantastic. Any numbers at all in there? Yeah. How many numbers, just so I can check? Eight. Two numbers. Fantastic. Okay, let me just check. And you're logged in at the moment, did you say? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I can't see that. Um, okay, that's fantastic. Can you confirm what your password is, just so I can check the system, please? Um, I'm not really sure. I... No, it's absolutely fine. We've got we've got authorization from the head office, so it's absolutely fine. Say again, sorry. Stick. Brilliant. I'll just double check for you. So that's absolutely fine. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. So that was like a four-minute phone call. I actually got like 20 passwords that day. That company did really well for me. It was brilliant. brilliant. But, but the, the key thing was that, that I got into like different departments. And actually, the, the, the poor thing for this young lady is that password was used for all the marketing. So their Twitter account, which I logged into, uh, all of their kind of Facebook accounts, their link, corporate LinkedIn account, everything, right? She reused the same password. And the password was actually the company name and two numbers, right? <laughs> which is like, uh, okay, so how they hadn't been hacked, I had no idea whatsoever. But there was, she changed that afterwards, and then we had a little debrief. Um, so it's not just the, uh, the kind of that side. It's also the physical side as well. So part of my job is to break into buildings. So I've broken into... I said banks, I've broken into large insurance companies, retail companies, uh, data centers. Uh, at data centers, you have to wear outfits. That's uh, it's a bit weird. You have to dress up as a BT engineer or something like that. So, but generally, it's quite easy. And, and actually, the easiest way is like tailgating. We all, we all know tailgating is easy, but this is actually a very large gambling company. Um, and I got a shuttle bus. Uh, and the only way to get in was actually if you rode the staff shuttle bus, you were seen as being working for the company or a contractor. So they just let me straight in. There's a gate there, and there's me walking in. And this guy, thankfully, opens, leaves the door open for me. And I'm, I'm in, and I was there for like, you know, a couple of hours before, you know, they start chasing me down. Because this guy here um, had seen me in the smoking area, had seen me get in and not tuck my pass in and tailgate in through the main gate. So I was being chased by security guards for about 30 minutes until they actually found me, um, which was always a, an interesting story in itself. But um, so yeah, you can you can have some fun in these places. Um, so why why are developers prime targets? Well, there's a, there's a kind of many many reasons. Um, as as we just pointed out, they don't really get focused with training because we're very technical. So therefore, um, you know they're not they're not really taught, taught about some of the threats that are out there. They're not they are prime target for for attackers. They're actually becoming increasingly uh, a prime target for attackers, so um, especially search engineers. So what are what are the kind of core vectors we're talking about? Well, we're talking about the fact you might have privileged access, you know, um, potentially used as an attack vector to reach mass customer base. If you look at the NotPetya uh, kind of outbreak a couple of years ago, that was a software company. Their update was pushed out to lots of uh, uh, lots of companies and caused massive, massive uh, updates. GitHub and GitLab pages and public repos are prime targets. Um, especially for contractors who potentially give, give them temporary access and they use the same credentials. Um, and again, so it's, they are become pretty much a prime target. And there's been a couple of cases recently with like Gentoo Linux and uh, EventStream where, you know, developer accounts are likely targets for phishing or password reuse. And the attacker basically had access to all the environment before, uh, after about, you know, 20 minutes or so, they realized someone shouldn't really be doing RMRF. Uh, it's probably a bad command to do. So therefore, uh, they, got, they, got, uh, they got stopped, luckily. Uh, or EventStream, 
uh, where the uh, owner of the library um, got convinced by somebody in their community who'd been contributing very well to the community, convinced to hand over ownership, and the second ownership was un uh, handed over, he basically ran crypto mining software across all their customers. Uh, and uh, if you've ever read the, uh, uh, the GitHub page and all the comments, it makes for a great read. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, but he got, he got, they actually managed to get back control of the environment, so, which is what we talk about. Um, so, so what are kind of the usual suspects? What are the kind of usual things that we see from social engineering? So we see the kind of standard phishing, the baiting, the pretexting, uh, quid pro quo, and all that kind of stuff. These are kind of the standard tools that we use. Um, our quid pro quo is also known as Kaiser Social, if you've ever seen the film. Um, but you know, it's kind of like you know, trying, to, trying to manipulate or trick your target into giving away valuable information. And it's actually very interesting to do because um, we, we give away lots of information. So out of interest here, it's one of the show of hands, Who's got, probably not going to show their hands now, right? It's not passwords, don't worry. Um, right, who, who's got like uh, more than three email accounts? Who's got more than five email accounts? Okay, good. Uh, who runs an email company? Uh, no? Okay, just check. Right, okay, so um, most people have like a, a number of accounts. They have a work account, they have a number of personal accounts, and they don't really separate it out. And of course, there's a lot of information you can find on somebody just from their email account or from their pro uh, profile. Um, who reuses their... Uh, a profile picture anywhere on any other sort of sites have the same profile picture. Um, some people do on GitHub, by the way. It's quite a popular way to do it. They have the GitHub page with that profile picture, which is actually their LinkedIn profile, which is also probably their Facebook profile. I'll show that later. Um, um, but pretty much, you know, images and, and information we share, it's very, very easy to kind of track down. It's kind of how we, we do this, right? So there's, there's a load of tools that they can use. I mean, there's like, like thousands of open source intelligence tools, and there's lots of great tools on, on um, on GitHub and all this kind of stuff, but but things like you know the Harvester for running uh, credential uh, credentials and email uh, scraping, uh, tools like uh, 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 or sites like Open uh, and Awesome OSINT. Um, I know where your cat lives still works. Have you ever tried that website? You get a photo of someone's cat, you can actually see potentially if they've been seen on CCTV cameras and there's some quite clever uh, matching and stuff. Uh, I've actually found someone from that, uh, believe it or not, it's actually kind of crazy. Uh, lots of folks that are cast, we actually worked out where they were. Uh, creepy, it still works, it's great uh, for people that still have location services turned on, which hopefully everyone has location services turned off on their social media. If they don't, I can basically do a heat mapping and see where you tweet on a regular basis and work out where you live. I found someone uh, that way. Uh, Glassdoor tells me what the company's like. So if I'm going to profile a company, I can work out the culture, I can work out the dress code, I can work out... Um, if it's a great place to work, if there's an open management structure, if it's an open working environment, so I can work out before I even get there how to fit into that organization culturally. So there's lots of information out there you can use. And what we do is we use it for like, you know, collect the information, we kind of do the pretext analysis of that information, uh, and then we do like the scenario creation. So we kind of work out how am I going to get into this company? How am I going to target the developers? How am I going to target the IT people? How am I going to target the people with privileged access? What's going to work for them? And it won't be something from work related, either be through the supply chain or it'll be either through um, something they're in their personal life that I can actually target them with. So the best one I used was uh, who's, who runs a bug bounty program here? Anyone? Yeah? Okay, so if anyone runs a bug bounty program and they have a, or they don't have a bug bounty program, the best way to actually trick someone is actually by submitting a false bug, saying, I found this thing on your website, embed some malware into the, uh, the request, the screenshots. And of course, most people will open it, and then actually that's a way to get it. I'm probably giving way too much away. But, but that's a good way to try and turn what is people accept these things and trust that there's good information coming back, and actually that could be a tack vector to get in. Okay, and there's a kind of other ways I've done that as well. Um, uh, so it's things like I said, you know, how do we do this? The, the key really is about looking at data harvesting, so doing the automated collection, the public records, the databases, so looking at password dumps. Um, who checks have I been pawned on a regular basis? Good. If you don't, please check it all on a regular basis because it's very useful. Um, uh, uh, and then who uses password managers here? I'm assuming everyone uses password managers. That's pretty good. Two-factor for everything, I'm assuming, as well. Good. Right, so they're the kind of things to look for. People that don't use password managers, people that don't, don't use two-factor because they're the easy targets because I can basically see they reuse their passwords and I can get to their accounts quite quickly. Um, and again, there's lots of great tools out there, but most of it is, is kind of automated at the beginning, and then the most value is actually in the, in the kind of enrichment of that data. So once I've got a piece of information on you, and then I'll go and do expand my search, expand my field of vision. So take the one piece of information, and then learn everything about you, and then pivot again until I get all the information on you. Um, so I can start with images, I can start with kind of common keywords about yourself, and then I can kind of really delve down into location data and everything. And 
To be honest, it takes about four to 20 minutes to get enough information to steal someone's identity, typically speaking. Uh, even if you have lockdown accounts, um, there's still ways of bypassing by, through your friends, by associations. If your friends don't have lockdown accounts, I can still see everything you've, they've shared with you, right? Um, so there's, there's ways of kind of getting this information quite quickly. And this is kind of great to create the kind of pretext. So unfortunately, um, I did pick on Amazon because they're a host, but I didn't pick on uh, anyone in particular. Uh, I did kind of blur out the names, apart from the person with Amazon in their name, because that was kind of obvious. Um, so I looked at your GitHub uh, repo, and I just saw I'll pick on one person, OK? The person with their name blurred out and highlighted. And I thought, what information can I find them in literally five minutes? So I looked at a GitHub page. They have like 32 repositories, a lot of followers, so they're quite popular. I thought, that's quite, that's quite good information. Who are they following? I looked at that, and that was quite useful. Um, I took their profile picture. I did a reverse image search. Uh, that brought up all their social media profiles. They used it everywhere, um, <laughs> which is quite interesting. So I found their LinkedIn profile, their GitHub page, other companies they work for and they contribute towards, uh, other projects, their blog, which is quite useful, tell me how they write, their, their development styles, the, the languages they use. Um, uh, that also showed me the contact information. So I found their Twitter, their Facebook, their LinkedIn, their GitHub, of course, already found. So I found their, their Facebook profile. Uh, also found other images, which I could reverse image search and showed me a match. So it brought up other information. It then brought me to, of course, a LinkedIn profile, which brought up their company pages. So I did some more information about who they work with there, the type of company they work with. And this is in five minutes, right? Uh, I found a, another profile picture, which was our first image search, which just brought up images of pugs, unfortunately, but there you go. Um, uh, I found quite a lot of information about this person, um, to the point where I actually managed to get his email address uh, for one of the companies he works at. Uh, I worked out his Amazon email address anyway. That took me a couple of minutes. But I wanted to find an actual email address I could use. Um, so I went, well, have I been pawned? And of course, he's found in seven breaches, right? And that email address, and a work email address, which he's quite senior at that company. Um, and it's actually still used today, the email account. Um, so that took me five minutes, and I have access to all those data breaches as well. So I have uh, a couple of my plain text breaches, so I could have seen his password. I didn't, of course, because you know, it's public information. But, um, but that took me five minutes. So five minutes, I've got enough now to gain access to his password, with potentially access to his accounts potentially enough information to work out how I could send them a phishing email or access the account altogether and use that to pivot into Amazon maybe or into other companies that he works with. So that's just five minutes, right? And if I have a day or a week or a month, I could find a lot more information. So the small bits of information you share just from your GitHub profile could lead me down all kinds of different avenues to try and find out information about you, where you live. I found out where someone lived just through a photo on her Facebook page. Um, I knew roughly the street she lived on and I found that she had a house with quite unique double glazing. So I just went down the streets that I thought were nearby and actually looked at a house that had a double glazing with the same brickwork to the left. So using images as well as a pivot point to actually use Google Street View to find out where someone lives is, is quite useful as well. Um, of course, there's other sites like Nerdy Data. You can take scrapes of code and you can see what other companies use that scrape of code as well, all those services like Stripe. So if, you know, if you've got a particular target, uh, and they've got some vulnerable code, or you know that they use a particular snippet, you can use it into nerdy data and it'll show you all the companies that are vulnerable or all their customers. So if you want to target their, their supply chain to use a proxy back to them, that's a very useful uh, source as well. Um, and also uh, Google dorking. This is probably my favorite Google dork um, uh, from one of the guys I know called uh, Kashanga. He's, uh, he's on my community and he actually he found this dork and I've, I've used it every day pretty much ever since. Um, and basically Trello, everyone, developers love Trello, most people don't use it, but some people do, and they don't lock it down. So you can find like bugs, or you can find vulnerabilities, you can find passwords in this as well. So I just picked a couple I found at random. This one's a live site, still going today, so I can look at all their bugs. So it's, a, it's supposed to be a, a, a private Trello board, but they've, they've not changed it to private and it's public. So basically you can see all of their bugs, look at their bugs, um, look at how they write code, and look at target them. Okay, so it's quite quick and easy. Uh, this was a, a game I found yesterday. Uh, it's being developed at the moment. And they've got quite a few bugs. Um, and again, like I said, they're actually, actually dumping snippets of their code in there as well. So again, you can look at vulnerabilities or, or reversing that code as well. I've obviously obfuscated that code for security reasons because it's quite vulnerable. Um, so that kind of is, is kind of brought me to you know how easy it is to kind of find something. That gives you the ability to create the pretext. So the more information that you, you, you kind of share, the easier it is for people like me to kind of... Or, bad guys, not me particularly, um, the bad guys to actually get into your business. And people don't realize this, right? So there's, a, there's kind of tips. There's tips that I could, uh, I could share with you. Um, so like, what are the risks of oversharing? Um, well, it, it's kind of understanding that 
everything you share can be seen by somebody. Um, and actually, the more you share, the more of a profile someone might build upon you. So if you're a valuable target, the more information that you're sharing, the more I'm going to build a profile on you. And actually, it doesn't take very long to build that profile, as I've shown you. So the more information is out there, the bigger the profile, the more chance of actually getting into, into your accounts or targeting you. Um, and, and so we kind of think about think before you share, because um, most people just share lots of stuff. Who has a Twitter account here of interest? Good, that's great. Um, uh, and so there's lots of information. Facebook, so I don't actually still use Facebook. That's about, the that's about the numbers I was expecting, by the way. And LinkedIn, everyone has a LinkedIn account here. So LinkedIn account will share professional stuff. Twitter will do ranting uh, and probably fighting with people at InfoSec uh, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, uh, and Facebook will share our family life. So it's knowing where to go for information, right? And we try and kind of look at, you know, more information we can build, the more valuable it is. So trying to find out, you know, and trying to restrict the information you're sharing or thinking about what you're sharing and how it gives people like me more information on you. Um, so more, before you post something on social media, think actually, well, this is actually quite valuable to somebody. This is something that might be quite dangerous to the organization. And, and, and it's kind of quite important to talk about that because I, I've actually seen instances where people have shared quite sensitive information on like forums, for example. Right? So I've, I've actually done scrapes of forums and I found people sharing their signatures and actually talking about one guy actually shared a network diagram and left the IP addresses in it, which was unsurprisingly, they got hacked a couple of days later. No idea why. Um, so it's kind of like people share stuff thinking that for the right reasons, not realizing the impact. That's what we've got to start doing with thinking about as, as a community. And this video here probably uh, is the best example of that. What's her name? Um, Joelle. What was her name? Alex. Alex. Thank there you go, Johnny. Cheers. If you like our Facebook page, we give you a free hot drink and a free pastry. We have a new like for Damien. We have a new like for Damien. Hey, Carl, are you standing by? Standing by. Hi there, can I help? Yeah, I just uh, liked your Facebook page. Okay, I'll search Facebook I'm now. I'm searching Google. I have a phone number. <laughs> I've got his email address. Okay, Carly, are you ready for information on Damien? Yeah, yep, I am. Mother's maiden name is He banks with Carly, this is the girl coming in now with the blue scarf. What's her name? Nicholas. 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 His date of birth, 7th May. She lived at 38A. Just be a couple of seconds. Two children at age 4. Previous address. She's got three Yeah, got it. Damien, age 26 and a fitness instructor. How do you know that? Brody, nice to UCL. Martin went to South Thames College, assistant psychologist at Great Ormond Street. How did you know? That's <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm a Christian as well. Oh yeah, we know everything about you, Martin. Yeah. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Anna from Russia. This guy here is just happy. He's got the he's got the free pastry. He's like, yeah, I'm okay with that. It's free. It's brilliant, right? It's amazing. <laughs> um, so like, it's kind of like you know, so so. Like just innocently liking a Facebook page, right, uh, and actually sharing your tokens with the attackers is a, is a great way to get that information, and all the information is scraped from that, and, and actually that's how they got the, that's how they got that information so quickly. But it, it kind of shows that the the dangers of this, and it's kind of like you got to build compartments. You got like I said, you've got to, people here have got multiple email addresses. Well, actually they're probably in your name or something similar, so I can still probably guess it anyway. So you got to randomise this and make it harder to detect. And this is actually by the way the world's best fence ever built. Um, it's brilliant. Compartments, right? Hey, see, it relates. Um, right, so it's about like not using the same passwords. We talked about this. Everyone knows about not using the same passwords. Same, like I said, for email addresses and just limit the exposures. Make your email address almost random, completely unrelated to you. That's hard to detect. So if I find it, it's very hard for an attacker to work out who you are. That's why these password breaches work really well. Um, and why the um, sex exploitation emails that went around that, that saying that you've been watching porn and I've caught you and uh, I'm watching your camera and I've downloaded some malware and here's your password because it had so much information about you. People panicked and went, oh my God, I've, they've, they've caught me and because I had something to hide or most people just ignored it. But because there, there was a chance that it could have actually, they could have actually done it, people then paid them. And actually that group made like, like 23 million or something like that, ridiculous, in Bitcoin. So you know, it, it, it's kind of the small bit of information you can use against somebody that establishes the trust, right? Or not the trust, the antitrust, but the credibility factor. So as long as I have something that makes me credible, um, uh, it kind of works. So my best one was uh, I, I, I found a head of IT for a company and I sent a phishing campaign to him, a spear phishing email. And all I did is I used uh, a testimonial that he'd written for another company. And I just basically spoofed the email of 
um, of that company and said, hey, we are just updating our testimonial uh, for you. We just changed a few words. Can you just check you're happy with it because we're, we're, we're releasing a, a new website and want it to go front and page. The person opened it with about three minutes because we changed the words, a, using his own words. So people would be like, well, hang on, it might, be not, might not be my words. And they, he clicked it straight away. And that was like a CIO of a big company. So um, th th you can use that information against people very easily. Um, so with TripAdvisor, who uses TripAdvisor here? Huh? Who's left a negative or positive review? Brilliant, I'm looking for you later. Because uh, they are the best people, right? So people leave a review on TripAdvisor. You can find them. Easy to, people link their Facebook account still to TripAdvisor and stuff like that. You can find them. And basically, all you do is you read their TripAdvisor review and you use it against them as an attack vector. So you just go, oh, we're really sorry I had a bad experience at our hotel. Here's a, here's a voucher for 50% off your next time. Please scan this QR code. Uh, so they opened the document that could contain malware, they scanned the QR code, it could infect their phone, I've got both devices and I'm in. It's really that simple and it actually works quite a lot in phishing campaigns I've done before. So these are the kind of things that you can use really, really effectively. So creating compartments and not making yourself easily identifiable is something that could really be used against you, essentially. Uh, a bit like this, right? You've got to hide, it makes yourself not easy to see. I do love this GIF, it's still my favourite GIF. I've used it like a hundred times, but I still like it. Right? Um, Anyway, so that's what you want to do. Um, right, okay, a couple of points. Uh, risk assessments. So we all do company risk assessments. But what we really want to do is personal risk assessments. We want to understand where our data is being shared. Every time I share our data with an organization or a company, that's probably going to get breached. Are we happy with that? Are we happy with that information is being shared? Now, GDPR has made that a bit better. But we want to kind of understand the type of data that we're sharing and how valuable that data actually is. And also, um, actually, how quickly we get our hands on it. Because sometimes we just go out and register for something and not realize that if that gets breached, how we're impacted. There's like countless examples of that where you think you've deleted your account and they actually haven't. And then you get an email notification say, hey, we're really sorry, we're in this bad breach. And you're like, but I deleted my account because they haven't actually gone through the process of deleting you. So even if you do delete your data, sometimes they don't properly delete it. Um, so the kind of things you want to do is ask is like, where's this information? What forms it in? Do I know exactly where it is? If not, this is for yourself, not for the company necessarily. Is it stored with a third party? Can I accept the risk if it's breached? Is it secured? Is it encrypted? Who knows about my sensitive data? Have they accessed it? Are they viewing it at the moment? And of course, if it's publicly stolen or breached, can I accept the risk? And you kind of want to sort of do like a rag status, you know, sort of understand whether it's public, well, I don't really care. If it's public available information, I don't really care about it. Um, if it's sensitive information like social media or something like that, well, it's public, but I'm, I might care about someone breaching my account potentially. If it's highly sensitive like code or it's like your personal information or your kind of, you know, banking details, then you probably care a bit more about it. So if you start sort of categorizing your own data that you share, that will really help as well. Um, and I've got like one for, for final piece of advice about how do you, you know, how do you stop people like me? We'll never trust anyone, first point of view. So don't trust, but verify. So don't automatically assume it's someone that you trust. Always try and verify it. Um, so, you know, because social media has kind of trained us, kind of we've lost our natural instinct to trust, of, of, of trusting people. So, um, so we want to try and sort of turn that on its head and we actually go back to actually being suspicious all the time. Because every time we get loads of suspicious emails, but it only takes one to get through. Uh, or one phone call for me to get information about your business. I don't have to get your password over the phone because that's, that's quite difficult, by the way. Um, but one bit of information about your business or your organization, the software you use, your coding style, for me to get that information. So it's trying to understand, you know, if I know this person, is it unusual? Is it style of writing per normal? That's quite easy to spot sometimes. Sometimes it's not. Um, are they asking me to perform some action? Is this normal? Is it urgent? Should it be urgent? All that kind of stuff, right? And, of course... Um, if in doubt, do not reply to email, call the person back, all that kind of stuff, right? So but they're the kind of core cool things to do. But but make, not making yourself a target is pro probably the best thing. Um, things like this, so just one of my favorite sort of social engineering kind of things. Uh, disable the adult content filter, and loads of people clicked on it, and it was actually, uh, uh, it stole your credentials. So um, it was brilliant. So anyway, uh, I, I want to do more questions rather than me talking. So um, that's me, really. Um, don't get social engineered. There you go. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, right, uh, Sharif, I'm going to need your help. Okay. Uh, uh, right, so a question I got for you is, Stuart, has anyone tried to attack you back? And how successful or unsuccessful were they? I, I, I get lots of attempts all the time, uh, given I run a large community of hackers. Um, I get lots of people trying all kinds of things. I just basically have a rule I don't click on any links at all on anything or any emails I just generally don't trust or sandbox them. So basically sandbox all my emails, generally speaking. Okay. Questions from the audience? Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so obviously, like for those of us that are quite 
young, we grew up with technology, right? So when you ask, oh, how many email accounts do you have? Well, how many years are we looking at? The past seven years, the past 10 years? Because back in the day, we all started with the silly 25 blonde, whatever. And then as you grow up and you mature a bit, you kind yeah. of like, you know, let's, let's keep it professional. How do you kind of, not in, not in a sense delete that, but how do you control the data that is already out there about you to make sure that you kind of minimize the impact? Yep, it's a good question. So, so first thing you can do is actually do like a bit of open source intelligence on yourself. So actually use some of these tools to actually understand, okay, where does my email address exist? Um, actually, you know, put your email details into have I been porn first, all those other sites out there. So you can actually see where you, where you have been breached and actually where you may have actually still use that password because some people still use the same passwords from like five years ago sometimes. Um, uh, and also it's about trying to understand, you know, your limit of exposure. So actually where's my email address being used? Where do I know where it's being used? Okay, well, I'll, I'll replace that with another email address that I maybe, I'll separate them out so I'll have like four emails, one for like work and that's, that's, that's work and I would risk any personal accounts to that. Then I'll have like one, like a throwaway email account I don't really care about or you can use those online throwaway accounts, uh, email accounts, you can register once and they're the best ones anyway because then it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, and then you'll have like a couple of accounts you care about and then just start migrating those across uh, and start sort of randomizing them a little bit more. Uh, and then in case just eventually just delete those old email accounts, just migrate away. Um, but understanding where they're being used is the first bit and there's lots of open source intelligence tools that can give you an understanding of that. There's like checkmyusername.com and things like this. It will give you an idea, of, it'll do like a basically a return request using the APIs to say does the email address exist or not. And you can find out roughly where it's being used. Um, that gives you a good starting point. And then from there, you can kind of start, like I said, moving away from it. But yeah, definitely if you've got like really old ones, they're probably going to be somewhere, right? In some breach somewhere. So that's a good start. I mean, start. That's, that's to say emails, but when you look at it, you've got, you know, back in the day when, I don't know, like the high fives and the MySpace. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, all the blogging sites that oh, we were all so cool on and... You can just do subject access requests and requests to release it, basically, right? That's the best way. GDPR is actually your friend in some respects. I hate that term, but it kind of is your friend. Yeah. Is like, um, you know, some of them that have have been kind of, they're not in use anymore, but that data is still out there. How do you go about using GDPR to work for you? Are you talking about companies that don't long, no longer exist? Yes. Yeah, so yes. they'll still have a, they'll still have like an email account you can still reach out to for for, for certain things. Um, sometimes there's gonna be data that you just can't delete. So I, I spent like two and a half years trying to delete every photo of me on the internet. It took me two and a half years, and I did delete every one but two images. Right? Um, it took ages. Right? There's loads of images, and now I've got loads because of like people like this guy over here. Huh? <laughs> Oh no, I've got loads. No, I did a talk on I did a talk on OPSEC, uh, Capital One, and then actually overnight I had like hundred photos online, and then like more and more and more. So I gave up after that point. But um, but so there are things you can do to limit your exposure. Um, but I think the key thing is to understand you know what you care about. So actually, it, it may not matter. You've got images out there on your, online. Okay, there might be some images you you may want to delete, but there might be things I, I don't I don't mind about that. It's okay. Um, it's what's in your kind of th personal threat model essentially. So you might go, I don't care if I've got. Uh, a MySpace account from five, six, seven, ten years ago, wherever it is, that I was. Uh, there's probably not that much out there it's still discoverable. But there might be something more recent that you do care about that you might want to delete and you might want to kind of address. That makes sense. Hundred percent. Sorry, one more question. Okay, go for it. So yes. Then, so then, if I flip that, should I care what our developers, what sort of information they have yes. out there, and you know, as a company, what kind mm. of conversations can you have over the information that they have personal out yeah. there? Yeah, so, so it's about them understanding, again, the same kind of process, understanding how that can be used against them. So actually saying, well, actually, you know, you can do the same process I went through, just reverse image search their profile picture on GitHub, for example. Yeah. Um, get them to check, have I been pawned? Get them to check, you know, are they, are they reusing passwords? They're not using password managers. They're not two-factor authentication for a 2FA or even use, YubiKey is probably the best one, actually. But, um, but you know, any, any kind of, anything that can improve and reduce their likelihood. You know, they're not, they're not um, storing their mobile numbers on their social media account, all that kind of stuff, right? It's just reducing the risk, um, using like burner numbers, that's what I do. Um, so anything you can do to kind of reduce the risk is, is great. Um, so yeah, those kind of conversations are quite important because that's kind of what I was trying to get at today, if that makes sense. Okay, so thank you. Uh, oh, I have lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So can I ask a question as well about um, when you have been hacked, like my Spotify yep. account got hacked. Right. I knew it because they said, oh, you should change your email, and I hadn't, and it was really hard to get it sorted out. Um, but I noticed that, you know, even when I changed my card, it kind of, they kind of knew my new card number. So even when you change your passwords and everything, so once you know you've been hacked, what, how, what do you do then? Uh, so, so you need to look at, um, first of all, where the hack came from. So the hack could be your device, potentially. If yeah. they, so if, the, if, someone, if you change your account password, for example, um, and, and you change your email account, all that kind of stuff, and then they're still getting access, right? There could be they have access to your, they might have set up a, they might have set reset your password. Okay, that's fine. You can stop that kind of stuff. But maybe if they're, if they're uh, hacking your other accounts, it could be they've hacked a device. So the, the, only, the only way to kind of resolve that is just to basically bleach your devices. So basically restart your device basically from a fresh build, uh, really? all your devices. Um, because if you, if you can't understand the source of the breach, that's the best way to stop it from happening. Um, change your passwords across all your accounts, all that kind of stuff. Um, maybe set up a new email account and then start migrating stuff onto there slowly. So then you're, you're basically creating like compartments, as I said earlier on. You're segregating yourself. So you now have an untrusted set of accounts. You need to bring yourself into a point of trusted. So you need to start small and work outwards that way. I've dealt with people who've had their home environment hacked, by yeah. the way. And they've actually... They've literally had all their devices, all their yeah. IoT devices, everything hacked, and they, they can't get them off. They reset all their devices, uh, but they did. They still left their internet devices unchanged, so the hackers were able to get back in again and reinfect everything and re-pawn everything, basically. And is that all alt automated? Because you uh, know, no, that's right. probably that's probably manual in that case. Um, the, the, the the Spotify account might be something to do with Spotify, and maybe not necessarily your account being hacked. But you you would want to just take a precaution over it anyway in that case. Thank you. I think there was a question. Uh, oh, yeah. Did you ask? Uh, yeah. Uh, we live in the 21st century, and you just described how easy to get information, personal information from social media. Uh, but everything is under control. If, for example, tomorrow I will go and re remove my Facebook account, close LinkedIn account, remove Twitter, how much I will reduce the risk that you will how difficult it will become to you to hack me after that. There's still public records and stuff like that. So, so yes. it means that it will not help. It, yeah? it will help a lot because you're making yourself less of a, pro a public target, right? So target selection, I go for the easy targets, right? You, attackers are going to go for the easier targets. They're going to go for people that have lots of information on them, um, who have lots of data they can mine, okay? Mm -hmm. And, of course, they can learn about you as a target, right? Um, as soon as you start reducing that, you reduce your, your risk and someone else becomes a target, if that makes sense. But there's still ways. I've, I've targeted execs um, who had literally no public profile, no social media, still got their home address, still got their date of birth, still got enough information, mother's maiden name, public records, so you can go through public record checks. And if you know their year of birth and month of birth and where they're, roughly where they're born, you can go through the public checks and actually gives their father's name, their mother's maiden name in the, in the public records. So I've got enough to steal their identity at that point. Um, so at which point I was able to call up a records office posing as that exec to get a copy sent to me of the birth certificate. Right? So, um, so you, you can still do other things like identity theft, but then again, it's not retargeting you as a, as a developer. That's, that's, identity theft is much more of a bigger problem. Right? Um, there are things you can do, again, credit, credit freezing uh, your profile and things like this, having checking your credit profile on a regular basis to kind of monitor these things. Um, so if someone's going to steal your identity, there's still information to do that. It's just understanding, again, how uh, you might be exposed and then actually putting checks in place, like you said earlier on, about automatic automating it. You're trying to automate almost your credit profile, your, your digital footprint, uh, canary tokens and stuff like this, uh, to understand if someone's trying to attack you. So you can get an alert, you can deal with it quite quickly. Okay, there was another question. That's on the mic. Thank you. I really enjoyed the talk, so thank you very much oh, for that. You. But I think nowadays, for a company point of view, I'm not talking personal now, but I'm just talking for a company point of view, I don't think it's possible to actually restrict and protect the developers or anyone else who is of interest. So isn't it, don't we have to turn it around and say, actually, we have to have a sandbox for every email account and you know, for everything we open? Because we really can't. I can, I can teach my developers and they still go out in the real world and, and post stuff and, and can easily be attacked. Isn't it more important now to secure our environment so there's nothing strange going uh, on? I, I think you can do that to a degree. Um, I think there's always, controls are always gonna be your best friend, right? Um, but it's about making people situation, giving people situational awareness, 
And that's the important thing. So, you know, if you think about the situation where most people at the moment will be on their phones most of the time. So they'll, they'll get their bag stolen or they'll get their, uh, their wallet stolen because we're on the phone. We're in, we're in the moment. We're not thinking about the outside world. That makes it quite interesting for people who are like going to break into your building because everyone's on the phone. They're not looking at what's going on. They don't notice these things unless they're paid to do that. So it's the same with the, with the online world. You have to think about what you're doing and limiting your exposure. So yes, you have to have. You also have to have controls in place, but you can't just rely on controls because if someone uh, gets fished or someone uh, goes to a malicious website or someone actually enters their credentials into a malicious website and then I'm able to use those, yes, you'll have two-factor and stuff like that, but there's still ways of bypassing two-factor. There's still a phishing campaign where you can create a malicious site that then also parses the two-factor and asks for the token. They enter the token and you enter it and you're in anyway. There's ways of doing it. It's, it's not easy. It takes a lot of investment, a lot of time, but it is possible, right? So you can't just rely on controls. You have to combine it with you know, yeah. awareness and things like this. Right? Any more questions? There were some questions over there. Sorry. Oh, there's a question there in the corner. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Good shot. Uh, um, hey. um, hi. So as developers, we really implicitly trust two things, open source software or open source packages, and pretty much word of mouth on Twitter. So do you think that that is going to become a bigger attack vector in the future for developers specifically? Because you can, not, you can target not just individuals, you can target a whole group yep. by making something vulnerable popular. Correct, yep. Uh, that, that happened in the uh, earlier comments. There was actually a, a, um, a, a Russian group a couple of years back that targeted a fintech, uh, um, I think it was a, a component used in lots of fintech companies in San Francisco, actually. Um, and they were actually able to get into the, uh, the GitHub repo because the, uh, they fished the developer. Uh, they weren't using two-factor at the time. They were able to harvest their credentials. It was like an alert. Someone's logged into your account. Please take care, blah, blah, blah. They did it. They logged. They reset their password. Well, they actually re-entered their password and then reset it, so they actually didn't reset it at all. Um, and um, they were able to harvest the, the details, and then, and then using that developer account, were able to put a commit in there, which is basically malicious. They got passed through. No one checked the code, or no one checked the commit, and they got passed through. And basically, there was a backdoor uh, probably for about three or four months, where uh, literally, uh, I'll try and find a case study and I'll, I'll send it to you to update because it's a really good case study. And actually, they were actually able to then, this was being used in lots of fintech companies, particularly within San Francisco um, and all over the world, but that was a big area for them. So basically, these companies then had backdoors and the attackers were able to get in. Um, and they were actually searching for these backdoors and these, these web applications. So th it's definitely a big attack vector. No one really talks about it because open source, we love open source, right? It's brilliant. It's great. And I, I'm a big supporter of open source because I'm here tonight, right? But it's also potentially an attack vector as well. And it will become an increasing attack vector um, as, as long as, you know, people, you know, also GitHub have obviously put in place like you know, lots of conditional controls, but not everyone's implementing them, right? So it's important just to say that it still could happen. It's just... Um, you know, it's just a matter of time before it, the big one happens, I guess. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Yeah, there's a question here. Uh, we, there's a question. Cool. Careful. Hey. Almost. That's good. Uh, so let's say that you try to target someone and you try to harvest some data about them. Let's say you find like four or five emails that are like related to one of the accounts. How do you verify that those are actual emails that have been set up by like the owner and not someone else? Uh, so you mean like the like uh, what third party? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can do some validation, so you can actually check that the email's been used because most people will use email address somewhere else. But it's a standalone email. There are some checks you can do to see if it's a real email account or just a service email account. If that makes sense. Um, so you, you, are you talking about like? So let's say it's some. Let's say it's someone that like everyone knows, and you have people that try to set up different accounts for them. How would you verify it's the actual person? Oh, the target. Not? I'm trying yeah, to target. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you can, you'll do some validation before you even. I mean, most most times, I, I won't be paid to access email accounts unless I have permission, right? So I can do as far as check whether they they reuse their passwords, where they reuse their passwords. But an attacker would just log in and find out if they if they can get in. If they can get the password. If, they, if that if that's mm -hmm. if they found that person in a breach. And they can validate that's the person through. There's various checks you can do, so you can look at whether that email's been used somewhere else, whether that matches their name, their company, the type of role they do, um, whether that profile that's being used is 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 valid and still active, and all that kind of stuff. 
there's lots of things you can do to check. There's like about three or four different checks you could do to validate that person through other, other sources of data, which you don't want to do anyway. And then an attacker would just try and log in or try and get into the account as quickly as possible. They'd want to get mobile numbers as well in case they have two-factor, or they might want to try and um, use the SS7 network to kind of crawl messages about them, um, things like that. But um, you, you try and validate as much as you can as, as a social engineer doing it for, for a company before you try any form of attack anyway. Lots of questions. Yeah, there's one more. Oh, here we go. <laughs> How has uh, GDPR impacted your work, and what's your opinion on it? It's a great question. Um, okay, it has actually affected me. So there was one case I did. Um, uh, so I targeted a charity company maybe six months ago, I'd like to say, five months ago. And they'd just been through GDPR training, which is really bad timing for me, by the way. Fresh training in a call center was really bad. And it was my target was to get into the call center to get access to uh, support people. So I was actually targeting the support desk and um, the call center and the support desk. And so the call center people had just been through GDPR training. So I managed to spin up a, I found out who their, their um, supplier was. So they were using a third party support company. So I basically set up a support number that looked very similar to that. Um, uh, Skype number, it was very, very similar, I was very lucky. And I said, look, you've got, um, your computers might be running a bit slow today, we're gonna give you some dedicated support because we're doing some work in the data center, so if things are slowing down, you can call me. So I got support calls for that day, which was absolutely fantastic, but when I actually did my pretext um, for actually getting people's passwords, they were like, sorry, um, we can't give that information because it seems like GDPR. Now the, the head of the call center gave me all of the people's team members' email addresses, full names, job titles, which is quite a sense of information to some degree, but wouldn't give me the password. So I got like 60% of the way there. I even got shift patterns and all this kind of stuff. It's brilliant. But it's, it made the job a lot harder. And actually, I was actually quite happy with that, at the fact that they actually said, look, I need to check. It's GDPR. I'm not sure I should give this information. I need to get approval from information security. And I'm seeing that a lot more. It's, but as, as people don't do regular GDPR training, and it's not part of their daily job, I think it will just people fall back into that kind of sense, false sense of security, if that makes sense. But yeah, it's a good point. It has made it harder, and it will make it harder as well. Yeah, there's uh, one more question at the back. I think everyone wants to go home, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully a quick one. Um, so again, GDPR related. Um, what's your legal basis for processing for profiling people using publicly available information? It's a very good question. So um, we have to get permission from the customer. So if I'm doing an open source intelligence piece of work, we have to get permission from the customer that we can do it. So usually if I'm doing a, a bunch of execs, I'll get their consent beforehand, right? So uh, if I'm doing a social engineering pro, uh, pro project, I'll scrape the information, and then before, and when the report's uh, sent through, I'll redact the information like I've done today, and all the data collect will be deleted. Um, so I don't store any of the actual information um, about them. So the only thing that's stored is the redacted information about them, if that makes sense. Um, the fact I could access their profile picture, I could access this. Um, if I have permission from the user to investigate further, then I will share that information with them, if that makes sense. If it's just like I'm going to, after a company in general, what information's out there, there'll be people. And if it's like data breaches, for example, well, I'll actually share that with the customer directly, then delete my copy of it. So I have to, I have to comply with GDPR as well. Um, I have to have consent, mostly. But it's all publicly available information. But the point at which I collect it, it becomes more valuable, more sensitive. So someone's social media picture over here, not sensitive, combined with the data I build upon them, becomes a very sensitive profile. So we have to be very careful how we treat that information. So it's pretty much deleted upon uh, collection once it's been reported. Uh, shall we take one more question? I have you one, one question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned um, running with security guards and so on. What precaution, precautions do you put in place to not get shot, especially with facilities where like trespassers will be shot on site, that yeah. kind of thing. Okay, so back to my US story. Um, so I, when I did this, um, so there's a bit of a backstory to this, right? So when I was in the US, um, it was a kind of last minute gig. So one of the guys was actually off sick. So I had to then go and cover for him. So I basically had a do not detain that wasn't ready for me. Um, so I, you're supposed to have a do not detain. That's the first thing. First rule of uh, social engineering club, have a do not detain letter because it's really bad, right? Mm -hmm. So I got, I, I, I actually did my first site without a do not detain. Also, the client had to confirm which branches. They just said, just do some branches, had confirmed which branches. Uh, and also had confirmed, I didn't know if they had armed guards or not. I had no idea. Well, it's, it's, most bank, banks have armed guards in America. Luckily for me, these didn't, but it's in my threat model. So the, the most thing I would do would be, this is a simulation, this is a pen test, 
if you want to reach to my pocket and here's a do not detain, uh, blah, 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 you can see it's a test. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't reach my pocket myself because I'd get shot. Um, so that's in my threat model. I'll do everything to be polite, courteous, not aggressive, compliant. If I'm if someone's pointing a gun at me, I guess. I haven't had it yet, uh, but I probably will get it in the next 12 months, probably. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Don't get shot. Yeah, I'll try, I'll try not to. Yeah. I made this talk. That's a good yeah. thing, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> there was a question at the back as well. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. All right. <laughs> good catch. It's dangerous, that, right? It's like soft. <laughs> it's, uh, Qu soft. Uh, I have a question. Did you use GDPR request to get data of the, for a victim? I have done a subject access request, um, a fake subject access request to get data and to test the validation checks. Uh, and in some companies, they ask for ID to be sent through. Uh, some companies, they may give it to you um, actually verbally over the phone if you, or, or by email if you give them an email address. Um, so I've actually done it to test the policy. Some companies have really good policies in place. Some companies are just like, yeah, we'll send it to you within 28 days. Did you try like for getting information about victims that's not for directly from company? For example, GDPR request for no IP or someone else provider to get information about the victim. Uh, I haven't I haven't done that yet, um, so I, I can't really answer that question. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's possible, uh, but I haven't done that as part of my assessments yet. Okay. Okay, I think we've run out of time, so uh, thanks very much, Sid. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So, Thank you.